So I'm, I'm sort of leaping into the, the lion's pit here today because I'm, when I was asked to speak, uh, uh, Michael made the mistake of asking me what I wanted to speak about instead of suggesting something. Um, and I've been speaking for the past year now about the subject of my, my book, Who Owns You? The Corporate Gold Rush to Patent Your Genes. And I'm getting kind of tired of it. Um, although this happens to be a very exciting time for this, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in relation to the lawsuits that are uh, going on and the various bills and whatnot that are sort of bringing all this to a head. Um, but I, I'm now working on the next phase of my work, and it, it's a culmination now of uh, 12 years of, uh, of work on the subject of intellectual property and philosophy. Um, and so it's a, this is an exploratory effort, and I'm interested in your reactions. Um, I'm going to start with some fundamental axioms and then give you some premises and try to work through an argument that uh, has convinced me, not just of the ethical problems related to patenting genes, but of ethical problems related to all intellectual property rights. So our first axiom, and I take these as uncontroversial, if you don't accept these axioms, then we're going to have some disagreements. We have fundamental rights to autonomy of our minds and our bodies. Okay, this is pretty standard uh, liberalism right from Mill. Axiom two, we have fundamental rights to freedom of expression consistent with Mill's liberty principle. So do I need to reiterate that principle? This, this, okay, so according to uh, J.S. Mill, uh, we have unrestricted liberty except to the extent that it injures someone else, okay? So this is the notion of the liberty principle. This is a basic fundamental notion of liberal democracies. Um, and again, if you disagree, then you can just step right out. <laughs> All man-made objects intentionally produced are expressions, and these are the only subjects of IP law. Now we're gonna get into a little bit of philosophy, uh, because this is not what you're used to hearing. If you study, in, who's here studies intellectual property law? Uh-oh, okay. I'll watch out for you guys. Um, we, we're, you, I'm using terms a little differently than you are used to using them. Because, and, and this is based on my first book, and I'll explain how I mean to use these terms. Um, so my first book was uh, The Ontology of Cyberspace, and it was the culmination of my um, PhD dissertation and uh, some work I did after that. Um, and the crux of my interest in cyberspace was the puzzling problem of the simultaneous granting of patents and copyrights to the same sort of thing, right? I'm sure if all of the IP folks here understand that that's a problem because ordinarily the subjects of, in, of patent law and the subjects of copyright law are what logicians call mutually exclusive, all right? And there are, ta there are cases in, uh, leading up uh, before software that make that clear. Except that along comes software, which then bridges these two worlds and starts to get both patents and copyrights. So this implied to me that cyberspace is either a unique hybrid object, something entirely new, or that the categories of patent and copyright have been incorrectly drawn from the start. And guess what I conclude? Um, my conclusion uh, was that cyberspace is not some sort of new, uh, the term ontological, that's a philosophical term. It simply means, uh, well, ontology is the study of being. And I prefer to use this term over metaphysics, which sounds too much like uh, transcendental meditation or something like that. But ontology is simply the, the study of categories of being. And if we're talking about the nature of something, uh, and we're using terms that are ordinarily uh, uh, used to describe two mutually exclusive categories, and then we have a, an object that fits into those categories, we have to ask ourselves, is something wrong with the terms, or is something wrong with the object? And, and my conclusion is it's not a problem of the object, it's a problem of the categories. And I looked at the history of, you know, of machinery leading up to software, essentially. And 
Does anybody know what that thing on the left-hand side is? You can guess. I have a text hint. A jacquard loom. And what's a jacquard loom do? Uh, we use cloth based on uh, paper punches fed into a system to give a certain pattern. Exactly. So what you see here are holes on, these are not paper cards. These are big wooden slats or metal slats with holes on them in a certain pattern. And the jacquard loom uh, is an early uh, form of computer. Uh, it reads the software uh, on these big plates of metal with holes in them. Uh, and it weaves for you a pattern, uh, easing the work of uh, weavers. Um, and I say it's a matter of degree. It is a smooth spectrum between the wheel and software. All of the, cat, all of the objects in between are really the same sort of thing ontologically speaking. Uh, and I'm going to defend that a little more for you because some of you are skeptical. Um, <clears throat> this spectrum, I say, consists of, uh, on the one side, things that are primarily utilitarian, and on the other, things that are primarily uh, aesthetic. And all of the objects of intellectual property law can be categorized somewhere on that spectrum. Okay. And what are these things then? If the categories of patent and copyright don't really describe these things accurately, <coughs> I say we can use a very common term uh, to describe exactly what they are. Uh, and they are expressions. Any idea made manifest in the world is the expression of that idea. Now, we perceive these expressions for different purposes, right? The description of a of a well you know, pump that is not going to ever uh, fill your glass of water, right? But that description is an expression of the idea of a well pump for a particular purpose, a primarily aesthetic purpose, or maybe a utilitarian purpose if it is an instruction on how to build a well pump, OK? Um, and so I claim that th this is an example. Um, software is an example of the faulty ontology underlying intellectual property law, not because it is a new sort of object, but because it is an object that does things in a very quick way. All right? This is a text that we don't directly perceive. It is a machine whose moving parts we don't directly perceive. But the ontology of it is the same as that of a jacquard room which is uncontroversially a machine, or a novel, which is uncontroversially an expression of a sort of another sort. If you have questions, if you want to debate me now, uh, I'd ask that you, you, you try to write them down, hold them off, because I want to get through this. There's a lot to get through. But if you need clarification of anything along the way, I'm happy to do that. OK? So any, any clarifications at this point? Good. Our next premise. And this is also a bit of philosophy. Um, rights of ownership stem, stem from brute facts of possession, and laws are just when grounded in brute facts. So recently, The Guardian reviewed uh, this book. It, it had a very favor favorable review, but it said, I have this quirky natural law theory, which is true. It is quirky. But I'm going to defend it for you, and uh, maybe some of you will be convinced. It's not essential to my argument. But I, I like it. So where do property rights stem from? I claim that rights to things like land and movables, which, OK, and, and I should first tell you a little bit about uh, John Searle and the notion of uh, social objects. Uh, has anybody read Construction of Social Reality? Or, no, no, it's a great book. Um, he really explains the nature of institutions, I think, quite accurately. And what he says is there's a world of brute facts. That's the pre-institutional world, right? We can think of the world without any of the legal or social conventions that we now use to understand the world. And understand that there is, before all of those institutions, there is a world of brute facts, all right? So, now, Matt, and this is a tall order.